All right, this is the bastard. And this is the bastard's big brother. And we just uh, inadvertently talk smack about our mom. And this is the pastor with no answers. So how are you doing, Jared? I am enjoying 2017. It's just a fantastic year. So far, so good. You don't sound like you mean it at all, brother. Oh, I totally do, man. I'm riding this Clemson Tiger high still, and that's true. The Packers, that's true. Are, the Packers are rolling still, yep. so it's everything's yep. good, man. Yeah, for sure, man. That was. Um, we'll have to. Uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll put this episode out next so we can talk about some current stuff. But for sure, man, that uh, that Packer game. Golly, Aaron Rodgers is something else. I just saw where the this is the most decorated. Um, division championship weekend ever. Um, Super Bowl, Super Bowl MVPs, oh, yeah. Pro Bowl, yep. and all that stuff. I mean, it's pretty pretty crazy. So I wanted to ask you something. Have you recently erased, uh, or like, obviously you and I do digital music now. Have you recently gotten rid of music because you just weren't going to listen to it, not based on it being sucky, but based on it being like uh, outside of your morals, I would say within the last two or three years, there have been some rap songs that <laughs> just completely gross me out to where I would just get rid of them from my iTunes cloud. Um, so, so yeah, it's happened. So did, not a lot. Not often, before not you threw them away, did you try yeah. playing them in your bedroom just to give it a whirl? What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I just recently did this. People know that, that uh, I buy a lot of music for Christmas. People give iTunes cards. You hooked me up pretty good all the all the time. And uh, so in Pitchfork's top 50, you had 21 Savage. And I remember throwing out there to some people what were some of the albums that I got. And uh, one of my buddies that I've met since doing Bad Christian, uh, Jordan Clark, he's a big hip-hop fan. He was just like, hey, man you know, bump your 21 Savage in the church office or something like that. And I was like, oh, was, I wonder what, why, <laughs> wonder why I said that one. Cause I obviously listed some other rap albums and I'm telling you, man, from start to finish, it is just female womanizing filth. And it's like, yeah. it's like for me, I, I can, I can be okay with one or two songs. And uh, it, here's what's here's what's funny is that when you have this is kind of like a dilemma when you have a really good hip hop CD from start to finish you're like man this is so good and then one of the best songs musically and lyrically you know as far as its flow or or whatever is just perverted sexual eating this I mean just and you're like, ah, oh, this sucks because I really like this song, but I don't think I can keep it because <laughs> I'm oh, I don't want to listen to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this this doesn't happen often with you, then? No, no. I would say okay. very seldom, very seldom. Yeah. yeah. How about individual songs like you asked me? Yeah, I will do that for sure, especially to yeah. spare a good rap CD. Like I remember, I think the most songs that I've cut in a while was the sec the second Schoolboy Q album. Because um, okay. there was just, you know, some songs I was like, good Lord. And I, I don't know. I guess for me, it, it's it's weird because <sighs> I don't like super, like, I, I don't I don't prefer super violent stuff either. Like, you know, someone's saying, you know, really violent stuff about killing this guy or killing that guy. But I think maybe the sexual stuff bothers me <laughs> even worse, which if you think about the irony, it's a little messed up because usually when you kill somebody, it's not voluntary. Uh, they don't want to be killed. But if you're talking yeah, sexual but, stuff, it's usually with a woman who you, at least they're saying is into it, you know? Right. But I, I think, I mean, I, I guess in my experience listening to rap, the stuff where they talk about killing people, it doesn't seem to be nearly as detailed and explicit as the sexual <laughs> acts they're performing on the women. So I, it doesn't bother me as much either because yeah. they go into such gr like gross detail about womanizing. And that, that to me is, is way more repulsive than just popping a cap in somebody's ass, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I yeah. I think it, what, man. I think what's really interesting too is, you know, a lot of people think, man, just the, the kind of music that these kids are listening to as they grow up. I mean, you know, I taught two years in a, a school, 90% African-American, and, 
you know, I had a, developed a close relationship with these kids. So we talked about a lot of different stuff, hip hop being one of them. And I was very interested in this. Like I was asking them, like, you know, do you guys buy into, you know, all this, you know, glorifying drugs and glorifying, you know, negativity towards women and all that stuff. And the ones that were vocal about it, which were, you know, most of my students, they reacted very quickly and very harshly. No, 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 Mr. S. And like many of them even took it a step further. They're just like, man, some of these people, they don't even do what they're saying they're doing, man. It's just, it's just for show. It's just for act, which, you know, doesn't necessarily make you respect some of the content more, but I found it very interesting that a lot of, I mean, we're, we're talking seventh and eighth graders that not only did they not buy into a lot of the messages being sent, but they also did not believe that it was authentic from the actual artist, which I believe right. is probably a little of both. I, I think some of them, pro, you know, probably are pretty hardcore, uh, you know, in the gang scene or whatever, and 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 you know, with women, all sorts of different women and all that sort of thing. But I'd say a lot of them. Um, probably is just an act now i'd say probably the one the womanizing thing is is consistently authentic i would say just because yeah, a lot of those probably. guys can get whoever they want but sure. the uh the killing and stuff i'm i'm not so sure about but yeah. dude i've come a long way man since the i don't even listen to secular music early in college i remember the <laughs> i remember you gave me static prevails jimmy Eat world and i was like man this is just so good it can't be bad <laughs> oh like, that was before you started listening to the non- Oh yeah, I, I got. I really? mean, I, I would I would borrow CDs from you, but I would eventually kind of feel guilty about having them in my possession and 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 get them back to you. Like I remember one summer I listened to a lot of uh, the third Ballstones album or whatever. It's Let's Get This Straight something. Uh, okay. I forgot what that one's called. But eventually, yeah, I would want to give them back to you. Where I think the summer of '98 is when I was just like, Nah, shit, I'm gonna own this. Like I'm I'm gonna. I'm, the, these bands are just too good, and this is just so stupid for me not to listen. And that was when you gave me Jimmy Eat World. Um, I had just bought Diary Sunday Real Estate, which I, I thought maybe could possibly be a Christian, so I think that maybe uh, let me enjoy it a little bit more than normal. And then that summer, I, th- I think I ordered the Deep Elm sampler with, like, okay. Apathy Cast, Branston, Camber, and all those, and I was just like, whatever. I'm, I'm all is that around in the now. Time, is that around the time you were getting the mineral, too? Yes, yes. Okay. But I but still, still through that season, and I think I may have told you this before, I ordered uh is it Drive Like Jehu or Drive by Jehu? Yeah. No, drive and like uh Jehu. super old school raw punk sort of emo band. And I'll rem- I remember on the cover of the s- the actual C D, I think it had uh something G D and I was like, man, I, oh, oh, God, oh, oh. <laughs> so I took, I took a sharp, uh, the sharp part of a compass, um, oh, you know, and I, and I scratched it out, having no idea that it would mess up the whole CD. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went so far as to order the damn CD again because I was just oh, like, what God. was I doing, man? That was stupid. <laughs> I ruined it. But just wow. craziness, yeah. craziness. Yeah. But well, yeah, dude, it, 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 it did not take much at all. I mean, even Christian CDs where the whole album is completely blatantly Christian, they could have one line in there that I'm just like, oh, that I don't think that sounds right. Or one weird vocal delivery, and I'm like, man, that sounds demonic. I mean, just <laughs> crazy. Because, I mean, <laughs> here's the thing, dude, is like I used to, I used to think like if, if, if some of my suspicions are valid, then there's I'm inviting demonic activity into my bedroom at night if this stuff is living in the CDs. I mean, that's how crazy yeah. it got. And I was just like, man, if I go to sleep and demons start coming out of my CDs, well, that's on me. The Holy Spirit told me that this stuff was messed up. But so, I would so say I, I, I would say 99% of the time it was just my mental illness clicking in for sure. And I attribute some of that to that. Remember that video we, we were shown in a uh, in youth group where they had all these different like 70s and 80s metal bands that were playing the stuff backwards? Remember that? We watched it yeah. in youth group. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The back- So I think, I think you know, being in that context, like that that ultra spiritual context and then coupled with your OCD, you know, I can totally see that where that would come from. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Because they, they were making it seem like, 
that pretty much any band that wasn't a Christian was was demonically influenced. Oh yeah, totally. That was like the message of the movie. So. Yeah, yeah. But not only that, did we also had people, you know, like our our aunt and other leaders in the church that would that would even though we resisted this notion, but would say, "Nah, your music is the same thing. Sounds the same. I don't care that they are talking about religious stuff. Just look how they're dressed and all that." So it almost like grayed put put some gray area in there, and you're just like, "Oh shoot, what if they're right, or what if they're." There's some imposters that got into the Christian scene. That's, that's actually the wrong scene, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna actually talk to someone else who I'm pretty sure had maybe somewhat of similar upbringings as Jared and I. Uh, Nate Henry. A lot of you know him as the uh, I'm pretty sure singer of Sherwood. I mean, I, I, I never was into the band myself. I thought they were kind of sucky, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> actually, actually like the album with the tree on it but it does show you just how much i was into them and the only reason why is because by the time they really started putting out music i just wasn't into the real uh, poppy kind of emo sound but super awesome band obviously we've had dan coke on here a handful of times so yeah joining us is nate henry All right, we have Nate Henry on here, and Nate, how's it going, man? It's been a while since I've talked to you, probably since you were on the Bad Christian Podcast. It's crazy how you can actually meet and develop friendships strictly podcasting, because I don't think I've ever met you in person, and if so, I apologize, because I don't remember. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I share your... Uh the oddity that it is you can make friends with people digitally yeah kind of awkward yeah but it 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 exists yeah totally and jared i would say nate if if you want to if i had to give you a snapshot of nate i would say nate and dan coke are very similar except nate's not an asshole so just take oh, okay. just take right. dan coke and minus the ass <laughs> actually i'm kidding i haven't i haven't really been able to get to know nate as well to make any sort of character assessments but i know what really you know, spurred on having you on on this podcast is, you know, last last I talked to you was on Bad Christian. We talked a lot about the Sherwood album that came out on BC Music. And we did yeah. kind of get into some theological stuff. And stupid Matt Carter always wanted to steer us out of that and, uh, you know, keep us talking music. But we, we got into enough that really whet my appetite to really get into right. it a little bit deeper with you. And uh, we were, Jared and I were just talking about how back in the day, and, and I, don't, I don't know if, you, if, if the three of us share similar upbringings or not. I know Jared and I obviously do. But back in the day, I used to uh, buy Christian albums. And the whole album could be blatantly uh, Christian lyrics and, you know, just a, it makes my heart feel good. It's like, oh, this is edifying and this is awesome. Yeah. And then you throw in one line that may could be misconstrued into them actually not believing in God, just something so crazy. I would actually tell Jared, I was just like, yeah, that album gave me a bad spirit. And I mean, he, he took that, <laughs> he took that terminology and just ran wild with it for the rest of my life. I you hear. freaking burn cassettes, dude. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Did Jacob's I, trouble. I burned a you, Jacob's you, trouble. Table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Oh my god! I, I had to get it out of the trash, and I resurrected it to listen to my own room. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> so, I burned it then because you wouldn't have been able to listen. I no, do you, think you I burned, threw it away. No, you, but you burned part of the uh, the covering, the, <laughs> the album art or whatever. Yeah. Oh, you that took is that crazy. shit pretty so, seriously, man. <laughs> I, I I think I did that. I, I I think I threw some CDs out the window in in the front yard and yeah. smashed them. Yeah. I think we all had that smashing party where yeah. we, instead of smashing pumpkins, we smashed the pumpkin CDs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Jared, you remember uh, you remember my ex-girlfriend Jennifer and youth group, they were having like this big Hallelujah night, you know, substitute for Halloween. And they were having that big <laughs> record smash. Yeah, hallelujah night. And they were having a big record smash uh, game where you actually pay a ticket, you take a baseball, and you smash records that are up against the wall. Well, she she found like a Beatles vinyl, and she really wanted to keep it. They would not let her keep it. They were like, nope, sorry, secular. We're smashing oh the hell out of it. God. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> man. Oh, boy. So, like so mind numbing. Yeah, so, Nate, let's, let's kind of start at the end and work our way back. Not only are right. you not... Uh, a Christian at all, but you hate all of them a lot and oh, yeah. want to ship them all to an <laughs> island because they're holding back progress, correct? 
Let's get rid of all of them. <laughs> Ship them off. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not even sure. I, I, I excuse me for not knowing. I, I really don't know. Do you consider yourself a Christian, or is that a thing of your past, or or what? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think the word is pretty ambiguous nowadays. Yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, I definitely consider myself a Christian. Um, now where that goes, uh, everyone has sort of their own definition, I guess. Yeah. But, um. I don't think I'm evangelical anymore. I think I was, but yeah. I, I, I guess evangelical, there's a lot of things that come with that, and some of those I would debate right. heavily. Right. So, well, If you had to say what evangelical means to you, what would that be? Uh, evangelical to me means that you believe like end times theology. Gotcha. Um, you believe uh, you have to be saved. Yeah. You uh, believe that Christ definitely died just for the forgiveness of your sins, nothing else. And then because of that, you have to share that gospel constantly. Wow. Right? Yeah, I mean, I've just never heard it put that way. Like, I've never heard it really reduced to very specific theology. I mean, that's actually, like, I've always thought of evangelicalism as almost like a, a way, which kind of is, but just kind of the the brand of Christianity, uh, the feel of it, you know, the the people that, you know, I guess some of the stuff that you're saying, witnessing and all that, but that that makes a whole lot of sense by just saying uh, in 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 times theology kind of, you know, and just like we yeah, gotta yeah. we gotta get this stuff done, you know, before time runs out and And, and that's the Catholics what... wouldn't be on that team. You know what I mean? They would be doing something else. Gotcha. Um so Somewhere in between all that is where I am. I don't know. Yeah. So exactly. So what are some of the core beliefs of, I guess you could say, Orthodox or traditional Christianity? Do you actually adhere to, or if any? Um, I mean, I, I, it's it's hard because like the last four or five years, I've really deconstructed, and I'm starting to put back my faith to where like I'm. I'm I'm able to like get excited about it. Yeah, I think okay. for a long time I just wasn't excited about it. Um, I, I definitely believe that Jesus um, wasn't just a nice guy or uh, you know a prophet. I think Jesus was you know uh, the Son of God. Now, what his ultimate mission was, I think we are quick to stamp. Oh, this is exactly what he was doing. Right. And now I'm I'm looking back at it, going, I don't know exactly what he's doing. He he. He's doing a lot of things. He's yeah. doing a lot of interesting things, secretive things. He's off in the distance. He's coming back. He's going again. And, and and I and I read it differently now. Before it was like I knew exactly what I believed. Before I read the scripture. Now I'm kind of going back, going, well, what is this actually saying? And reading it as if I don't know anything. And so I'm not as quick to say this is exactly what I believe or don't believe yet anymore. Yeah. I'm I'm more willing just to go. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure. But I'm interested. It's the most interesting conversation that I would like to participate in. Like, I'd rather talk about this on our podcast probably more than we do. So, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, Jared, him, yeah. <coughs> uh, Nate, and Matt McDonald are the don't feed the trolls guy. I'm sure you've probably heard oh, of us okay. talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. it. And yeah. uh, we've had Matt McDonald on here a few times as well. Yeah. yeah so, gosh, that's like, here. here's one thought that I have because I, I don't, I don't want to go so far as to say I guess I would I would say that I've probably shared a lot of similar experiences as you Nate but I'm I'm definitely well I don't know I mean how you described it maybe we are on similar places I would say I I definitely believe Jesus is the son of God and I definitely believe he came uh to rescue us and I don't know exactly. I guess one thing that I would be a little more open-handed than I used to be is um, like Jesus's death and resurrection. As far as that wiping out sin, could God have done it any other way? Like I would say, eh, if I had to guess, ninety percent, yes, He had to do it that way. Otherwise, that would seem like a pretty malicious, mean-spirited father well, yeah. just to send his son to be tortured on our behalf. Um, but I, I definitely, I definitely give a lot more mystery to it. And, you know, we were talking about this, uh, recently on bad Christian and, you know, one thing that I, that I would say, and, um, sometimes I wonder if I scare my brother sometimes with, with how I talk about this stuff. But one thing I would say is I cannot stop believing in Jesus. Like I, and, and that's the one thing that I can almost get me choked up is 
whatever is going on in my head, whatever is going on, whatever's going on in my heart, I didn't choose it. Like, and that's one thing that mm. has been eye opening for me is a lot of times, you know, growing up as Christians, when we see people, you know, starting to to doubt things that we see as essentials and maybe starting to question things, I always wrote them off as well. They're being rebellious. They obviously want to do whatever they want to yeah. do, and the, and you know, obviously believing in God a hundred percent doesn't allow them to do this. But all of the the questions that I have, and all the navigating that I have, and all the rethinking, I can either deny it and push it down. Uh, because I think it's bad, which I think would ultimately be very harmful. Or I can say, God, I am entrusting myself to you, and I certainly am dependent on you uh, to walk me through all this. And there's been times, man, where I have just felt such abundance of peace come over me. Because there's been times where I've, I've definitely been scared through this process, extremely scared. Hmm. And I've been like, I just, I don't know. What do I believe? You know, this this is really scary. And I just feel like a comfort from from God that I can only attribute to who I believe Jesus is. And it's almost like a father patting his son on the head saying, hey, it's okay. You are totally fine. I'm with you. I keep showing you I'm with you. You just need to believe. Yeah. And then that feeling kind of goes away, and I feel like, okay. I And I know that may sound crazy to some people, and I don't feel compelled to convince people that it's, that it's real. All I know is it was real enough for me to truly believe that Jesus is, has got my back and he's taking care of me and he loves me. And I think because of that, I feel like the questions that I have, uh, I can endure through, you know, otherwise it would just be too yeah. scary. Like if I felt like I'm investigating all these questions that I could possibly wrong in, and there's a chance that Jesus isn't true or he's not my savior, I, I would, I would be psycho. Like I, I would lose it, you know? <laughs> yeah. There, there is an element of fear in I think when you start to deconstruct at any stage of the game, you start to get a little worried and, and fear, fearful. And I think that is a big problem um, because I think a lot of the, like I was raised Southern Baptist. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you know, when the, the, the fear is a good motivator to get get people in the seats on Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, and it's a big part of the theology. And when the fear just stops working for you as an individual, um you are you're not you're okay to ask the questions yeah like okay is god really a wrathful god is jesus satisfying god's wrath i don't know yeah i don't know yeah and then i used to be like no 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 that's exactly what he's doing and i couldn't even deviate from specific you know five points about god and mankind and these were all these lists and i had a you know i had a systematic theology that i was taught from various teachers and there's just things you couldn't deviate from right and and now i'm like man that's just that just sucks yeah because you don't know what you believe if that's how you're taught and sadly most people are just kind of taught a system they stick to the system they don't deviate and then they just go on facebook and try to convert everyone over to their system and yeah and uh and they have no little joy and they have little happiness and so i i would say around 27 is when i was like i don't know right i have no idea right but until then Dan and I would fight in the van when we were on tour together uh, pretty often because he kind of started asking questions a lot earlier than yeah. I did. And I was. You're like, shut Christian your face, school. man. I'm not listening yeah. to that. <laughs> You're like, I'm not listening yeah. to that bull crap. <laughs> yeah. That's relativism, man. Yeah. Hey, Jared, let me, before you, before you ask this, let me ask Jared yeah. something. I've never understood, Nate, what you said as far as. You know, the church fear is a good way of getting people in their seats. I get that, and I'm even open to that sentiment. But if what we have all believed for the majority of our lives is true, there there's fear innately in that circumstance. It's like, if you don't give your heart to Christ, you are going to be tortured in, in the most unimaginable way forever and ever, and you'll never be able to get out. Like, if if that's yeah. what we truly believe, it I don't even see fear as a tactic. It's like, hey, the reality is fearful and and I'm doing my job to tell you. Like f- well, if that was true, the church would operate like communism and we would all join and then a few people would work for the whole rest of the church to go out and convert souls. That's all it would be if the church actually believed what you just said. See, I don't believe we actually believe that. I think what we, part what part the I don't think we actually believe that people are going to die and burn and be tortured forever. Because if we really did, if we really did, we would operate like China. We would just 
the mass would be the most, the most important thing would be go out and convert as many souls as possible. And people wouldn't have these jobs or just kind of casually go about being humans in America. We would be converting souls 24 seven. Well, that was, kind the of machine. The, that was kind of the premise. I think that, that Francis Chan took in his book where he tried to counter, I guess it was Bell's arguments. Uh, about, yeah. about, and so I think he was saying that, yeah, I mean, cause I think he truly believes that. And he was saying that it really does pose a tremendous existential crisis because you know, once you really buy into that, then you, you look around you and everyone around you is potentially going to be burning in hell. So yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely a constant like existential struggle. Oh, if you truly totally. believe that. Yeah. Right. And so, everyone, so, yeah, everyone's a salvation project. They're not really human. They're like, you know, they're just sort of like, it's like multi-level marketing. Everyone's a customer, you know, and you sort of talk to your friends in these weird ways and they're like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get me to go to your church, you know? And that's how I used to see people. And now I try to see people at least equal to me, if not better than me. Um, I used to see myself as better than everybody and I had to convert them, you know? So that's totally flipped. I don't, I don't look at myself like I know more than the other guy does, you know? I'm like, I don't, I probably know less than you. What can I learn from you? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still think you can take, you can still believe that it is your mission to, to witness and at the same time not believe you're better than anybody else. It's just Jesus made a difference in, in, in your life. Like the only difference between you and the worst sinner in the world is Jesus and, that, Jesus and that's it. So I think you can still maybe, operate with humility. I think it's possible. Well, maybe. Maybe maybe what witnessing is then is totally different for for me and an ev- evangelical. Okay. Like for me, the hardest thing is to not be a carnal human. That's the hardest thing not to do. So when we're sinning, we're 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 really carnal, right? But right. when we start, we don't want to sin. We stop living a carnal lifestyle, and that to me is a witness because people will go, "Damn, you know, like what." what motivates you as a human being? And then they start asking questions and you can say, well, this is what I found and this is what works as opposed to the evangelical way, which is you've got your little track in your pocket and you're ready to hand them out and you're sticking them on urinals and you're like posting Jesus on billboards and you're just, you're just out and you're vocal and you were slamming it down people's throats. Yeah. I think that's not very effective at all. I I agree with you there. Yeah. I just think you can still have good motivations and be humble and still do that. Yeah, I think it's just hard. It's very hard to find that um, that line of when you just kind of sound crazy, yeah. or you, or you're just not. I, I just don't think those guys get in. I think Jesus got invited over to hang with the with the non-believers because he he didn't do that. Uh, yeah, I don't it, see them inviting him over if he if at the end of the day he kind of pushes the track under the door. Like, I thanks for the meal, guys. Whoosh, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I completely agree with you 100%. I just think that maybe you could say these people are misguided. I don't think that every – we can lump them all as saying that they are arrogant and treating no. the other as as customers. I mean maybe some, yeah. yes, but I think I think it's hard to generalize that that way. No, no. I'm just saying that was my personal experience gotcha. as I started to gotcha. see my friends as that. And then I, I started to see the machine though because we would have these events and the it was like being in a band almost like – Okay, here's the marketing plan. We're gonna get all the friends from this high school into the building, you right, know. And right. I'm like, the, like I worked at a youth group in high school, and we had this. We were advertised on the rock station in Sacramento, hmm. our youth group, like the we, and it was like a big deal. And then the, like five different high schools would come, and they'd have this big like win, lose, or draw competition on stage. And at the end, after everyone had so much fun, it was like, and now sit down, kids, because we're going to tell you about hell. You know, <laughs> The total and, buzzkill. <laughs> yeah, right. it was just, and eventually it just kind of lost steam. And uh, and some of it got blamed on me because I started asking questions like, maybe this is just a big hype machine. Maybe it's just a big production. And it's just, that's not how it works. And everyone was like, Nate, you know, you're, casting doubt on this plan and so that was kind of the first real shot at like oh the church can really hurt and wound you when you ask it any question yeah uh so that's what i experienced in high school is just like you know i'm like driving to school and i hear like my youth group on the rock station between you know like blink 182 and other st- uh, you know uh third eye blind i'm like wow that's so weird you know yeah. mm-hmm. um but that's the kind of uh environment i came from so I saw Christianity as this, try to be as cool as possible, get to the edge of coolness, but at the end of the day, you're, you're converting people, and that's the goal. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I just, 
I don't think you can ever not see people as projects if that is the gospel yeah. to me. At the end of the day, they're always going to kind of be a project. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, I wonder if the only way around that, so to speak, would be to think in your mind, okay, the only way this person can come to Christ is through God. And if he chooses to use me in any way, that's on God, not on me. All I can do is be this person's friend, period. Yeah. You know, leave it yeah. at that. But I don't know. So. So take us back to uh, some of your conversations with old Dan in the car and fast forward <laughs> a few years. And, you know, yeah. what what were some of the first things that you started to let go of? And like how how scary was that for you or, or maybe not scary at all? And then, you know, if you had to describe now <clears throat> to our listeners, and I think you've probably already did a pretty decent job, but like what would be your most fundamental differences now than back then, obviously not seeing yourself as evangelical, not being sure as to yeah. the atonement and those sorts of things, but maybe some other hmm. things that you would describe. Well, I would say the probably the first memory that I have of kind of going, this is, there might be something wrong here, or uh, there's a, I don't know. I, I was in high school. I went to a Christian high school, and my and we had a zero period hour, and it was history class. Yeah, and um, and then so they would do announcements and prayer requests. Right, there was an odd kid in the class, and he would always have like five unspoken prayer requests. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Those and then are every awesome. Day, that man. number would grow. <laughs> I love the domino effect of unspoken too, because everybody can be quiet, and then one person says unspoken, the other person, oh shit, yeah, unspoken. I got one. Hey, unspoken. <laughs> right, and it just—it was always a joke. But uh, one day he pipes in and says, "Yeah, one of my friends committed suicide, and I just want to pray for for him." Yeah, and then everyone kind of got quiet, like, "Oh," uh, and then he goes, the teacher goes, literally says, "We can't pray for him because he's already dead, but we can pray for other people." Because he's probably in hell or something like that. Wow. And I was like, I raised my hand just to talk and, and, and to get, you know, get the conversation going. He goes, this isn't theology class. Put your hand down. And I'm like, wow. wow. You know, yeah. and that was senior year of high school, uh, Christian school. Teacher was Bob Jones University graduate. Yeah. And so were most of the teachers there. So that's when I started, started going, you know what? I just don't. I don't like the authority that comes along with a lot of this. Yeah. And then I would say from there, I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uh, for college. Yeah. Um, and they had a campus crusade that was like 1,200 people. Wow. It would meet every Wednesday. So it was crazy. It was like 20,000 undergrad and then like, you know, a quarter of them were Christians. Gosh. So... It was like a Christian school just got dropped right in the middle of a public university. It was kind of cool, but that's where I met all the Sherwood dudes. We all went to Campus Crusade, and we were like, let's start a band, and then that's how it all happened. Yeah. But that was kind of cool, too, because it kind of showed me for the first time there's Christians who who are all over the map, right. who are different and believe different stuff and cuss a lot and whatever, yeah. things I never, ever was exposed to. And we'll just be real with you and struggle with girls and all that things that you're just like, oh, I'm not allowed to talk about this or do this. So I think by the time Sherwood was, I don't know, four years into touring, Dan read a book called If Grace is True. Yeah. And it was kind of like an intro to universalism. And then I started arguing with him immediately like, no, this is this can't be it. Like God is he's you know, just you can't, and you can't, he's uh, yeah. uh, loving that whole argument. But but all this anger came out, yeah. and I was like, "Wow, where'd that come from?" Yeah, and uh, I, I have to defend these things pretty fiercely. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that conversation started going on. I wasn't able to really put it into words why I was so angry, but that's around when I was like, "Okay." And then I think towards the end of our career is when Mark Driscoll started becoming a thing. Yeah. And I had a lot. I think Mark Driscoll kind of was the climax of me deconstructing my faith. I was like, if this is what if this is what Christianity is, I can't stick with it. Mark Sorry. Driscoll, the deconstructor. <laughs> yeah, he did exactly the opposite on me that he wanted to do. So so yeah, so that that was like when I was twenty nine and that was like five years ago. Yeah. So yeah. 
Yeah. Like, so it's, I don't know. Do you ever have thoughts of, like, do you think in your mind right now, there is a chance that everything I believed growing up as a kid in high school, early 20s is completely true? Do you, first, first of all, is yes or no? Do you think there's a chance that everything you believed is true? Oh, yeah. I, ha- I have to have that um, humility to say that I could be wrong on either side of the coin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, all right. So, the yeah. second question would be if, if that all is true, wouldn't Nate? be in a category of detrimental to the to the gospel and to the advancement of God's kingdom and uh, potentially swaying people away from God? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I have that much of power yeah. and authority. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 I would say that would be scary if I thought that that was possible. Right. Um, so I, I'm not worried about that anymore. I'm not worried about screwing it up. I'm more worried about every day, like what kind of human am I today? Yeah. Am I living in this understanding or am I fear-based, angry, disconnected, unloving? Um, it's it's more like I got to the point where I'm like, how's it working out for you? Yeah. You know, like how's that working out for you? It's like, it's like this, you know, like if you're an Alcoholics Anonymous, it's like, how are you living your life versus the church, which is like, how are you following the rules? Um, I think I think I just got to a point where I'm like, is this actually going to make my life better? Right. Um, or am I just constantly afraid of doing things wrong? Like now I see sin, let, let, this is probably a better ex- example. Now I see sin as something that affects me personally, makes my day worse, as opposed to, man, I don't want to get caught. Yeah. You know, yeah. my whole life it was don't want to get caught. Yeah. And now I'm like, no, this has bummer consequences all across the board. Yeah. Um, I see the effects of it. Yeah. I didn't used to think of it that way, you know? Yeah, I'd say that's definitely been a game changer for me, what you just described is like, I mean, I, it's just low-hanging fruit. I remember, um, you know, as a, as a teenager and, you know, being in like a Pentecostal, uh, type church that Jared and I were in. I mean, it was very much so, yes, grace exists, but then you pra- practically you live out law, 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 and get your act yeah, together yeah, yeah. and don't mess up. And I mean, I remember just the tortuous hell that I put myself through, like after I would like masturbate to lustful thoughts or something. And I mean, it, it almost took hours to mentally, you know, part of this was my mental illness, but it took so long for me to overcome, okay, God has forgiven mm-hmm. me. I've said, please forgive me enough. And, you yeah. know, I've said the words right. And he, he, he does love me. He's okay. You know, we're okay and all that. And now if I were to, I mean, it, God forbid some of our listeners find this out, but definitely as an adult married male, I have messed up before masturbating to porn. And for me, it's like exactly what you said. Wait, God, de- God didn't like that because it's not good for my marriage. God didn't like that because it's not good for Joey. It's not good for those females, you know, uh, that are yeah. that are being pictured there. It's like if God truly is is loving, at least I mean, I'll go this far. At least me being his 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 child, it's not like this. I can't believe you messed this up again. Yeah, like, yeah. oh my yeah. gosh. Which, um, yeah, back in the day, that's how it was for me. Yeah, I think that's how it is for most people. I think, yeah, like I said, I think there's a lot of guilt and fear, and I think that sells seats. And I think that we, that's the message we hear first, unfortunately. Yeah. And then we hear the message, but no, but God loves you. But then it's kind of like, you know, you take a, you take a bunch of, you take a nice piece of apple pie, you know, and then, but you dig into it and then there's a bunch of green beans yeah. and you're like, wait a minute, this just doesn't, it just, it, 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 they never go together. Yeah. That, those two things. So you have to, I think, deconstruct and come back and say, no, the green beans are over here and the apple pie is over here and I can handle both of them separate and they're tasteful on their own, but you smush them all together and something's wrong. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, like as an adult now you can go, man, but it's not just like sins of the flesh, right. which are, I think, the most easily identifiable amongst 
the church. Yeah. Sins of the flesh are like the biggest deal. Yeah. Like, you know, if you you don't touch yourself, you don't look at girls and you you keep your hands in your pockets and you know or whatever and but like what about all the other stuff of the sins of the soul? Like, you know, like just just being greedy or being selfish right. or just being hate hate hateful. That stuff just kind of gets swept under the rug for some reason in the church. Yeah. I don't it's not a big deal. Like I've met so many pastors of head uh, head pastors of churches who are just egomaniacs yeah. and that's not a big deal oh yeah but man if if he touched another woman he'd be totally, fired immediately totally so. totally it's like the pride is is the one that everybody gets a pass on somehow yeah. jared so yeah. like one thing that i've you know i've learned about you since we've been talking a lot of theology and a lot of spiritual experiences and stuff is a lot of the things that in my mind, damaged me. I think you were uh, either smarter than me or just uh, more skeptical or what, but I think there were certain things that messed with me that did not with you because you were just like, whatever, this is ridiculous. Like, you know, some of the evangelists that we referenced that would come for revival yearly, you know, just those sorts of teachings got in my head and you were just like, this is, this is, crap like this is ridiculous yeah. i'm not i'm not buying into this like right would you say that there were some things though that you have that that you had to let go of like along the lines of the legalistic impulses and stuff like are there some um fine lines that you had to cross over because you realized that it just wasn't of god yeah i mean i think i think you guys have already mentioned a lot of, or already in this podcast the bigger things and that would be I know, Joey, your obsession with, with pleading for God to forgive you a hundred times or whatever if you yeah. do a sin. Okay, yeah. so in other words, grace was talked about, but it was really never like practice in our lives. And so I think for me, once I hit like 19, 20, 21, I really t- started to experience the power and freedom with of grace. With drugs and, oh. <laughs> promiscuity, all that stuff. No, <laughs> no so, so, so yeah, so that, that to me was the most eye-opening thing because I, like you, definitely did have this fear of impending doom whenever I send. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, that was my biggest thing. Um, but, but one question I had for both of you, and, and we've been using the word deconstruction a lot in this, in this podcast. So I'm wondering about the, the, the person who's listening who maybe is relatively new to the faith or at this point, relatively strong in the faith. And so number one, what's the motivation behind deconstruction? Number two, how do you proceed in deconstructing your faith? Either yeah. one of you. Uh, um, well, one, I'm just going to throw this out there. The reason I speak in stereotypes of Christians and evangelicals is because I know from Campus Crusade experience, hundreds of males that came from all over the U.S. came to one spot, and we all talked about what? Sexual purity. Right. That's it. Right. So every one of those kids grew up in a youth group, and that's all they talked about. So I know that the the gist of the evangelical church is carnal physical sins don't do them that was the gist of the message that most men got and that's what we talked about in college bible studies so when i say all that i'm i'm stereotyping but just know that it doesn't come from nowhere you know what i mean yeah um yeah. but to go back to remind me what you just asked because i had a good oh so, so yeah so there. basically the what's what's your motivation for okay. deconstructing your faith and then how do you do it i think i think you either i think you have to deconstruct or you just have to kind of believe someone else's beliefs your whole life. Because I think it's good to go through the Bible as a kid and, and read it, but eventually you've got to decide, okay, what what is this? And what is it for me? Or you just become a drone and you just spit out someone else's theology the rest of your life. Um, and you, once you deconstruct, you have two choices, I think. You can either go, I'm, I'm over it, I don't believe anything, or you can rebuild your faith even stronger. So those are your options. Mm-hmm. You can either kind of stay put, go your whole life, same, you know, go to Pizza Hut every Wednesday night for the rest of your life, never change, or you know, you can be honest with yourself and say, "Man, there's a lot of this I don't believe and I don't know what to do with it. Let's let's tear it all down and see what it means now." And a lot of people just have walk away, and I think that's a bummer that a lot of people do walk away because I have so many friends from Christian school just on Facebook will just say things I'm like, they just kind of adopted a different language and they're just super cynical. And mm-hmm. some people think that's how I am, but I would say the Bible is more interesting to me now. I probably don't read it as much, but 
um, I would say the stories are way more impactful now than they were because Mm -hmm. I just read it through a different lens. So that's, I think deconstructing is just part of the process. I don't think you can avoid it. So you're basically saying then that that what you're doing is you're thinking more critically about everything you took for granted as you were growing up in the faith. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, Or just, yeah, kind of like, but more saying, being willing to say, I don't believe that, you know, I don't believe that part of it. For what purpose though? Like, just for the sake of saying I don't believe it, like being willing to say that or or what? Be willing to be honest with myself. Like I think a lot of us, we we take our feelings into the way we read the stories, and some things are just like I don't think that's how. I don't think that's. I don't think that is the answer to this. Like if you know, we could all write a thesis on the prodigal son, and each of us would come up with different conclusions. Like who's the son that's 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 better here? Is the son that stayed at home or the son that took off and screwed up? Right? Mm-hmm. You know. Depending on maybe our own personal experiences, like our own relationship with our own dads and our own relationship with our own brothers, we would all come to a different conclusion for the same story. So when I was growing up, I was told, don't be that brother that goes off and sins. And I think now I would say (laughs) he's the one who figured it out. I have a completely different understanding of that story now because I was able to just tear it all down and say, what's the story say? Right. You know, oh, the older brother's the arrogant goody two shoes church guy that is super judgmental and the younger brother's the the screw up, but he but he but he comes home and the father isn't judgmental to nobody. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like like that story is how that's the story, and I will stick by that. Like if you tell me the father is judgmental in that story, I'll say, You're not reading the right story then. And if you tell me the older brother isn't kind of jealous, then you're not reading the right story. And if you tell me that the screw up brother isn't repentant and comes home, then you're not reading it. You know, so right. I would say I was taught a different story. And when I read them now, I go, damn, these are good stories. Who screwed this up? Yeah. And, or, or why did I think that, that something else was the conclusion here? You know, so I don't know that's a long winded uh, no, rant, I, but yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say the only thing that, and, and I would agree with most of what you said, the only thing that I struggle with personally is like the deconstruction process and if and i would say i use that word mostly because that's what everybody they they know what that means i I don't i think it's getting overused but i don't know if there's anything we can do about it but like it's with people that deconstruct and i would encourage anyone to just be be honest with what they're thinking continue to you know seek god seek truth and all that but the tough part is what you said, that some people end up with no faith at all. Like the Dave Bazans of this world who, you know, you sit with them in a room, you're like, man, this, is, this guy is just so awesome, just great social skills, uh, so nice, so considerate, probably lives his life better than I do, and yet he deconstructed to the point where he truly believes that his beliefs have always been just bullshit and they've been wrong that uh unfounded and and it wasn't even that he deconstructed you know to the point of discarding the unhealthy stuff it was no i discard all of this altogether and uh you know that's one of those things that i have to just totally trust god in because you know to answer your question jared as far as how do you deconstruct I, i i think for me it's or or what motivates you to, I, I, I wasn't motivated to. Like, I, I don't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to. It's, it's too uncomfortable. Like, I pushed against it, and I feel like God has, has been with me through the process. So, uh, and, and I think that that even becomes a whole complicated mess, too, because then it seems like, oh, well, what God has done in my life and in my mind and in my heart is what he wants to do for everybody. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that... Uh, if God's a personal God, then he's got kind of a, a plan for everyone. And I think that, you know, even, even someone who's a staunch Calvinist, I, I truly believe that, that God has a purpose for their angle and, and their train of thought. And, and maybe that's his plan for them too. Even though I think that whole belief system is just couldn't be any more wrong. But but see, I, it seems to me that it seems to me too though that your attitude about deconstruction is very humble. 
And it seems to me that the way to get sidetracked. And Nate Henry is, your... is a pompous no, no, bitch. No, not at all. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of saying though that I think that the, maybe the danger lies in when you put too much of yourself into that process and you you forget your humility before God, and that could perhaps be how one one person gets sidetracked in a band oh, gotcha. all together. Yeah, I gotcha. think. I, I like what I like what you said, Joey. Though, because I think it is involuntary. I think it happens. I think it happens to people whether they want to or not, because you just, you just start being the one guy in the room at the Bible study who will play devil's advocate. Right. And then everyone just is like, man, Nate, you checked your heart today. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I'm just asking questions. Why all of a sudden? And then you see the pushback from the, the majority when you start to ask those questions. And then you almost get a little cynical. Cause it's like, if I'm not allowed to ask these questions, then, then, then you guys are all in a cult yeah. because you are not willing to hear the other side. And it is crazy. So the only, you have to, you, deconstruction is just forced on people. Or you just are a lemming and you just go through the motions and you never ask those tough questions because people have been debating this stuff since the dawn of time. So, yeah, it's you, almost, you know what I mean? It's almost like if you believe in Jesus and you truly believe he's your savior and you don't have any questions right now, then don't ask them. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, if you don't have yeah. any deeply rooted uh, questions that are causing stress and, and sleepless nice nights and angst, then then don't ask them. I mean, that, so I don't, I, I'm not in any way saying, hey, people should, you know, deconstruct and rethink stuff and all that. I, I would say, hey, people need to be open and honest with where their mind's at. And sometimes... That requires, and it has for me, just verbalizing those thoughts. And someone, in my opinion, was used by God to set me on the right track. And it wasn't like, I'm not listening to you. I know what I feel. No, it was, oh, I actually needed to hear what that person had to say. Yeah. But unfortunately, there are certain things you just don't question. And if you do, you're seen as useless to the church until you can fix stuff. And I think that that is just, you know, that's why with, uh, you know, bad Christian, you know, in our BC club and people that have found each other through listening to the podcast, there is a space for people that, that don't believe anymore. And, and unfortunately, sure, there's a space for them in the church. I don't think any, most churches wouldn't say, yeah, we, we're going to close our doors to people that don't believe anymore, but it's almost like it's those guys that could be very detrimental to everything else. And so we've got to be very cautious with the conversation. And it just seems like maybe mm. that's not trusting God enough, but I could be wrong. Maybe that is a perfect example of, you know, uh, a little bit of yeast working through the dough. I don't know, but I definitely could, so could de go ahead. Could deconstruction be the same kind of thing that the Bible saying when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I, could that be deconstruction? Sure. I mean, I believe you, you involuntarily deconstructed your views on hell. Like you didn't decide. Oh, okay. You, you okay. know what? I'm going to choose annihilationism oh, because yeah. I like the thought of people not burning forever and ever. I'd prefer God to just destroy them once and for all. You can't help it. You, that's what you believe now. Like, and sure, right. it, it came about from you know hearing someone else's teachings and then researching it, it on your own and really thinking through <sighs> the scriptures and stuff. But that is a major deconstruction in your life that you don't believe sure. in eternal conscious torment anymore but you didn't but just to think but just think about what it would take for a teacher when you were say in high school to say hey here are three theories on hell um that never happened yeah right yeah there wasn't even the option to believe the other the other one so uh then one day you wake up you're 29 years old and you're like wait there's three theories who didn't tell me about these other two theories? Who didn't tell me right. about anni annihilationism? Who didn't tell me about universalism? Who didn't, you know, why don't I don't why don't I get to sort through these things? Now, maybe the scripture doesn't back those up as much. Doesn't mean it doesn't. Yeah. And we like to keep everything in that, you know, strict here's what we So that's frustrating when you wake up one day and realize there's all this stuff that wasn't taught to you to keep you safe you're going to deconstruct. You're going to go, okay, what else is missing? What else is here? What's, what's hidden? What did Jesus really do and say? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so that just comes with it. Yeah. I think. And, and, mm -hmm. and Jared, I mean, I would say other deconstructions in my life was what we talked about before getting Nate on was just me realizing it was okay to listen to freaking Jimmy world static prevails. It wasn't a Christian CD, but I was like, there's, 
I can listen to this. I mean, that, that was a huge step for me, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. to be able no, to say, no, wait a second, you know, all these people have been telling me you better just put in, you know, Christian music in your system and, oh, that's actually wrong. Okay, moving on. And now you're just deciding, do I really like Jim's voice better? Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> so, Joey, go, going back to that example, that's a really, really good example. So to get from point A to point B, was it the Holy Spirit? Was it your rereading of the Bible? Was it just you with common sense? Like, what do you think was instrumental to, from you to you getting there from point A to point B? To where it's okay to listen, to Jimmy? You are? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm big, big, big time spiritualist. When I and and for me, what that means is I I do believe that there are critical things in my life where God just. Uh, sometimes it's very subtle and maybe for the rest of my my life, I will think, man, was that God? But ultimately it was a life changing deal. So whether or not it was God, it was useful to me, but I do think that God speaks up with things like this. And yes, I think that was a Holy spirit movement of releasing me because it was, it was bondage. I mean, it was, it was such bondage to the point where I was scrutinizing, uh, blatantly Christian bands and wondering if I should listen to certain songs because they didn't make clear enough that Jesus was their Lord. I mean, that was, that's just ridiculous. And so I'll never forget, you know, when I started, I mean, another huge, another huge step for me, this is so funny. Fundamentalists would be like, you call that a step. You better repent or you're going to (laughs) step into the gates of hell. But uh, I remember a huge step for me was listening to old school rap and not the clean version. I was like, I don't, should I be hearing the F word over and over? Like, you know, uh, I think the first one was all eyes on me with Tupac and it was already aged, you know, 10, 15 years. And I was like, should I be listening to this? And I truly believe that God stepped in and said, you do not need uh, to figure out a filter system for your music. Just stop. You don't need to figure this out. And, and that has proven so true because the uh, the CD or the digital music Jared album that I told you that I erased recently, yeah. it was simply because I did not want to listen to that sort of trash from one song to the next. Like I just sure. didn't want to, and it kind of sucked because I paid you know seven ninety nine eight ninety nine for it. But I was like, I don't want to listen to this. It wasn't well. If you listen to this, you're in for some big trouble. This is you know you, you're you're walking a fine line here. So <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah I. I I've been there as a musician, being in a band and such. Like there was all that you couldn't support any of the music that was outside, and you found this little community. You got tribal around it, and you were you were a ska fan, but you only listened to Five Iron and Super <laughs> and the that insiders. You forgot about the insiders. <laughs> they were okay, you know what I mean. <laughs> and there, there was others, but it was like, but I but I think you know to go back to deconstruction because I think that's an important part of this podcast is I think when Jesus says. You know, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, he's saying, deconstruct your thoughts. I have something new for you that you probably haven't thought about before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he's trying to get everyone to deconstruct around him. Like, okay, you guys have grown up in this, this, this Jewish system of religion. You've heard it said all these things, but now I'm going to tell you some different thoughts. And they couldn't hear it. They just couldn't hear it. So if you can't hear it, if you can't change your opinion, then you are that guy in that story who's trying to catch Jesus in a theological trap. Yeah. Like, oh, well, who is the neighbor, Jesus? And he, you know, you're just bouncing around to get the answer you want and trick Jesus. And he's saying, look, man, you're, you're, you're debating theology. You're missing the, the whole point of me standing right here in front of you. So I think just, I was that guy in that room probably Yeah. to make this metaphor more of a visual, and I'm standing next to that guy, listening to him debate with Jesus, and I'm going, man, that's a dumb question that guy's asking. Yeah. Like, doesn't he hear what Jesus is saying? Why is he so paranoid that Jesus might challenge something that he believes already? Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm having this debate in my mind, reading Driscoll arguments and talking to Dan Koch and talking to my wife and seeing my friends on Facebook, and I'm just in the room while Jesus is debating somebody going, I just want to... I." I, I just identify more with what Jesus is saying right now because it feels more human. He's humanizing these this this system and these people. And it was like, oh, yeah. 
I like Jesus. Yeah. He's cool. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize it, you know? Yeah. So that's when the light came on. And then I was okay with being wrong. Like I'm probably butchered this whole thing, but I didn't feel like I was doomed right. at that point. Like I thought, oh, there's, there's, so that's how I see. I always try to put myself in those situations, you know, but totally. Awesome. Well, Nate, t- what what can people that haven't tuned into Don't Feed the Trolls, what can they expect from you and old Matt McDonald if they listen to an episode? Yeah, like Matt and I, well, Matt, you know, he's been on the, he, he's a, it's funny, like, um, him and I are very different. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were talking about the Enneagram the other day, and he said I was the most sensitive on the list, and sometimes he's... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he's the most unsensitive on the list. So uh, we battle different topics. We try to get different people on. We talk about everything from Bigfoot conspiracy theories to uh, theology. So it's all over the place. We try to get a good guest on, but Don't Feed the Trolls is the podcast. Um, and lately we've been talking a lot, a lot about spiritual stuff. So yeah. Are you a big... For your, for your fans. Do you think uh, conspiracy often, or are you pretty much... Or anti conspiracy, like I'll, I'll th- I tend to believe before I don't believe. Yeah, so yeah. JFK conspiracy or you know Lee Harvey official story. <laughs> oh man, I mean, I think I think there's something something hidden there that we don't know about for sure. How about nine eleven? Something happened. Nine eleven. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh whoa! I mean, More convinced than JFK. See, I'm the other way around. I'm like totally I mean, JFK, but then nine elevens. I'm well, like, I think so. I think something well, crazy I, happened. <laughs> well, no, I like I, the reason I say that about nine eleven is because like the European engineers science magazine came out and said something like there's never been three buildings that have fallen all at once. And like all of Europe, all the scientists in Europe are like something happened yeah. that was fishy. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's more science to explain why nine eleven is got some big problems. Um, whereas JFK, I don't know. It's just harder. Why well, the science that is there, too, though? What that bullet had to do? <laughs> yeah. Defy physics. I guess I don't know enough about it, but yeah. I watched that awesome um, James Franco uh, series that he did on it on Hulu. Did you see that one? Oh, I didn't see that, no. Uh, what was that one? It was really good. It was I can't remember the name. It was like a year ago. Um, it was all about JFK? Yeah, it was like he goes back in time to try to keep keep it from happening. It's, it's, oh. it's, it's very good. That's pretty okay. good. Um, that's pretty yeah, anyway, so I like I like the fiction and the history and it all kind of comes back. So um he finds this portal, this time portal in an old diner. And so he goes back and in Dallas and meets this girl and they, they try to save him, but it's really interesting. Really interesting. So I was really into that. So maybe yeah, maybe my mind is bent to the conspiracy stuff. But oh, cool. nice. I'm willing to ask those questions yeah. and most people are like, no. No, we don't ask questions. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So you're deconstructing history too. That's awesome, man. <laughs> I applaud that. <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm not that good at it, but I try to <laughs> get into it. All right, Jared. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, uh, ten is favorite person ever. One is you want him to die. Where do you rank Nate Henry? <laughs> I would say nine point nine nine. Good lord, man. Uh, yeah. I've yeah. never even gotten that rank. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, you guys are too kind. Nate, we'll have to have you back on. Hey, you, you have uh, kids, by the way? Two kids, yeah. We'll have to talk sometimes. I'd be interested to hear from you, like, what are some some thoughts that you've had to work through having undergone such a spiritual transformation in your thoughts and what that means to you as a father? That'd be interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that was a big part of deconstructing, but we won't go there. Yeah. But, like, when you have that love for a kid, you're like, okay, uh, I gotta rethink some right. things. This is, this is insane. Yeah. You know. Uh, so yeah, that's a big part of it, man. Yeah. But loved it. Would love to talk about that. Sweet. Well, Nate, thanks for being on. It was fun. Yeah.